Well, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Um, I had the pleasure of screening all of the episodes and I'm, I'm just blown away by it. Um, Thank you. It was, it's, That's great to hear. Uh, it was, um, there's just so many underlying things that happened there that led to the breakdown of, of everything and 45 people dying um, at one hospital during Hurricane Katrina. I was just wondering how, how did you come across the book and decide to turn it into a mini series? Uh, I just had heard from some friends that it was a great book. I ordered it and uh, read it, and I was just blown away. I thought I knew the general parameters of Hurricane Katrina, but I didn't really know the story of what happened during that storm and the flooding in the aftermath. And I think the brilliance of Sherry Fink's book was she burrowed down and told the story of this one hospital in New Orleans, but through telling that story, she really painted a picture of what life was like in the entire city during the worst natural disaster in the US in US history. And uh, having read that story, it was just so moving and got so stuck inside my head that I really wanted to turn it into a, a, a series. And then I had to outweigh some other people who had the rights to the book and uh, finally was able to convince uh, finally was able to get the rights and and uh, I teamed up with a wonderful talented filmmaker John Ridley to make the story. That's incredible. Yeah, there was a lot of things that I didn't I didn't know as well while I was watching it. Um, and the in the book, it said she she interviewed five hundred, nearly five hundred people for the for the book. Did you have the chance to speak to anyone who was there? did Did your team interview anyone? No, Sherry did all the work for us. She'd interviewed 500 people, so we didn't need to interview 500 people. <laughs> no, her book was such a impeccably researched and detailed account of the story that that was really the source material that John Ridley and I used to tell our fictionalized version of that story. And, um, you know, really for us, the challenge wasn't getting more information. It was really calling through the book and figuring out what was most important and what we should or shouldn't use. So I feel like the only one of the only people she didn't speak to was Anna Poe. Is that correct? No, she did speak to Anna Poe. She did speak to Anna. Um, I was reading the, the notes on that and she said she wanted to write it um, directly all about Anna, but she was going through everything at that time and couldn't really speak to people. I believe she did speak to her. That's awesome. Because I feel like it was really interesting how you portrayed her character, how you chose to show all the different facets of her. Uh, was it difficult to, to create her character? I think, you know, for John and I, our goal was to really try to show all sides of the story. And when we were with characters, to really advocate for those characters. And our job wasn't really, we did not want to be, we didn't see our job as passing judgment on the story. Our job was to present the story and allow the audience to make up their own minds about, you know, what they thought about what happened. And, you know, this, this is a group of characters that were really heroic people who in most cases volunteered to be in this hospital and try to help their, you know, patients and the staff and the members of the community sheltering there. And they, found themselves in a situation they never expected, a situation that they had no responsibility for, and they had to make some really tough and difficult decisions. And we really wanted to examine that process non-judgmentally and you know, let the audience just see what unfolded. And, and then the audience could make up their own mind about um, you know, the circumstances. But mostly, I think we were you know, trying to point out how any healthcare professional put in situations like this where healthcare has to be rationed, where you have to make decisions about who gets what or who gets rescued or, you know, who gets prioritized. Those are terrible, impossible decisions that, you know, no one should have to make. And hopefully uh, in the future, people will learn from experiences like this and, and we won't have situations like this anymore. Did you feel a sense of responsibility to honor all of the 45 people that died? I, I mean, I think that cer certainly acknowledging the cost and consequences of what happened at Memorial was part of our storytelling. Um, it was less about specific 
people who died or lived than it was about just telling this general story and trying to explore the circumstances that led to a bunch of people unfortunately dying. I love how it's a small part of what happened during Hurricane Katrina, like in New Orleans, and that you are able to show all the bits and pieces of what's happening around the hospital. Did you plan to do that from day one? Like, Yeah, we did. I mean, because the story was insular and so much of the story took place in the hospital, we were concerned about the show feeling claustrophobic or maybe the audience not having enough sense of context for what was going on. So we thought interspersing archival footage was a great way to let the audience know what the context was, you know, what was going on in the real world? Like, how was this being covered? What was Anderson Cooper saying about what was happening there? You know, what was David Muir saying about what was happening there? What, what are some images of, uh, you know, people who were displaced and, and suffering and dislocated and, it was also a way to sort of broaden out and, and I think touch a little bit more on this theme of the inequities that happen in times of natural disasters like this, because, you know, in the case of Hurricane Katrina, the, you know, people who suffered disproportionately were, 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 were people of color. And we wanted to show that and the, you know, we, the archival footage is a great way of kind of contextualizing what some of the larger consequences were of these events. I agree. I think you did a really nice job of, you know, creating that sense of like all the all the racism, even that occurred within the hospital. Um, but it's kind of like an, still an underlying layer. Like, how did you not? It, it's like front and center, but it's not. It didn't take over the story. Like, how did you balance that out? Uh, you know, I I would say the most important part of all of this is just having the opportunity to work with John Ridley, who is uh, such a brilliant writer and director and you know is is such a um, kind of rigorous but also humanistic filmmaker and you know just having a chance to work on the story with him and shape the storytelling with him contributed a lot to I think creating that balance that you're discussing. How about the um so you flew actual Coast Guard planes from the United States into Vancouver and created the massive helipad like did anyone say we this might be too much like how, how is that <laughs> well it's for a tv yeah, series <laughs> we actually uh it was a ho we flew a a we were able to get a coast guard helicopter into toronto across the canadian border during the pandemic which was um a real feat and an accomplishment but the coast guard really wanted to participate the coast guard uh felt that Actually, one of the guys from the Coast Guard said to us, it would be a disservice if this story about Katrina didn't feature the Coast Guard. So they really moved heaven and earth to come and participate. And uh, not only did they actually come to Canada where we were filming, but one of the crew members on the, host, on the Coast Guard heli rescue helicopter that we used was the son of a Coast Guard service man who served during Katrina and did rescues. So there was a real resonance and poignancy there. Wow. Oh, yeah. that's really neat. What about with all the water on set? Like 600 billion tons of water. Were there any like setbacks? Was it? I mean, it took, yeah, there was a lot of, there, there, sure. Yeah, there was a lot of, we built a 4 million gallon water tank. And of course, anytime you try to contain 4 million gallons of water, there are challenges to it. And we had to, uh, you know, make it safe for people to operate in. We had to color it so it looked like floodwaters, but we had to make sure that that coloring was safe and, um, and we had to operate boats in it. And yeah, so there was, a, there, there was a lot of focus on safety and a lot of focus on, you know, engineering. And uh, it was, it was very technically rigorous to recreate the circumstances of the hurricane and the flooding that followed. And, but it was really important. You know, I, I really felt like the authenticity of the story required the audience seeing, feeling, and understanding what the circumstances were like in and around that hospital. And so we did that. And fortunately we were, you know, um, really lucky enough to have the resources from Apple to make the show the way we wanted to make the show.
It was incredible. I mean, just the helipad and how they had to get there was incredible. I think you did a really great job doing that, but it, it, how did you, how did they create that? I mean, it was done in a lot of, you know, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, asking a, a magician, what is the secrets to your trick? Uh, you know, I think the goal is that you won't understand how we did it, but we combine a lot of different elements, but the really the the intention there was to just show how perilous it was to that thing that was an 85 feet above the top of a six story parking garage. So imagine trying to carry a, uh, a infirm patient who couldn't walk, you know, in 95 or 100 degree heat uh, through the hospital, often down seven flights of stairs in the hospital through a hole in the machine room up the parking garage, up these 85 perilous steps on this helipad, which was not in good condition, uh, you know, and it's, you know, vertiginous and scary, and you don't know if the thing is going to collapse. And we really just wanted to try to create the sense of that for the audience as best we could. And, um, and uh, so we, you know, we did it in a lot of pieces and then put it together in visual effects. Um, are there any scenes or stories that you wanted to include that you didn't get a chance to? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, fortunately, as I said, Apple gave us the resources that we needed to tell the story the way we wanted. And I think often in these kinds of stories, you end up having to make compromises for budget and cut something that you think, oh, that was really great. I wish we had that in the story. But we really, John and I were able to tell the story that we put on the page. And that was really fortunate. And, you know, we were lucky enough to get a wonderful cast to um to collaborate with in the telling of that story and and we really tried in the casting of the show to um you know be authentic to not have the audience you know jump out and say oh there's that actor or this person doesn't quite seem in this world and you know we we put a lot of effort into what i would say is sort of the naturalism of the casting to make everybody feel like they belonged in this world and of course, you know, when you have Vera Farmiga and Sherry Jones, um, you know, you can't really go wrong. They're both so brilliant. Well, thank you so much. It was nice talking to you. I appreciate thank you. it. Take care. Good to see you. Bye.